Hey folks, Patrick Francie here. I am joined today to talk about BC real estate. What's going on in British Columbia and specifically the Fraser Valley? And uh, joining me is Jordan Spitters of Eximus Real Estate, an absolute expert, investor focused. Well, let's put it this way, just a real estate focused realtor. And uh, Jordan, thanks for joining us and uh, kind of giving us some in the trenches updates on what's happening in British Columbia overall. But I know your, your backyard is Fraser Valley. You like to talk about it. But why yeah. don't we start? So first off, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, let's start with BC overall. When you look at what's happening in the real estate market, everything seems to be hot again. Uh, there is a lot of confusion, uncertainty. Where is this market going? But let's start with just an overview of the province in terms of what you're seeing in BC. And uh, mm -hmm. let's chat about that a little bit. Yeah, we had uh, we had a bit of a break. I think that break is definitely over. Uh, 12 months of, uh, well, not even 12 months. We had about three months of pullback, uh, nine months of just kind of stagnant, no growth. And then it was like a stretched rubber band that has just been released. Uh, we're back in multiples on a great many uh, property types, if not almost all of them. And uh, prices just continue to shoot up. Uh, we're mid-month, so I don't have May stats out. Um, but uh, previous months, we've been up 5% month over month, um, and it, it just continues to grow. So we'll have to uh, we'll have to see how this shakes out as we head into what is typically the slower summer season. We're only gaining momentum at this point. Well, let's just take one minute to, you know, interesting. We're here on a Friday prior to a long weekend. That's why, you know, I'm a little bit cash. But anyways, uh, when we look at what the slowdown is traditionally in a summer, is is the long weekend a bit of a marker? Like you go, OK, after the long weekend, we know things are going to get real quiet. Typically, yeah. I mean, kids are starting to get out of school. We've got folks that are leaving on vacation. They're gone for pretty much two months. Their heads are not in real estate. They're at the beach. And it's not until about the last week of August that it starts to come back and starts to pick up again. And then as you head into the um, the school season there, we've got maybe a September, October, maybe middle of November, uh, a mini kind of uh, pickup on the marketplace. And then typically just it dies right, right back down um, in the wintertime. Well, let's talk a little bit about strategy because I like to talk about investment real estate. I know you do it all, but mm -hmm. you know, as a potential buyer, as an investor, you know, I would think that in the off season, you know, there may be some deals out there in terms of motivated vendors who are going, I need to get rid of this property. Or is the market just so hot? There is no motivated vendors out there anymore. They're just doing what they do. And, you know, they're not worried about selling. Kind of give me a feel for it. You know? Yeah. Well, it, traditionally, absolutely. Um, this, the winter and the summer markets were great opportunities to go out and snag deals. The folks that are listed at that time are not because they have a whim and they just wanted to list. They're there because they need a job done. So, you know, they're motivated. I mean, I mean other people have clued into that fact. So there's motivated buyers out at the same time, but generally mm -hmm. you can get good deals. You know, if we stay the low inventory situation that we're in now with folks fighting over properties, you know, I don't know if there's going to be as many deals to be ha had uh, this uh, this summer season. It's going to really depend on on how this shakes out as far as inventory and whether or not the buyers, you know, pack up and leave for the summertime as well. Mm -hmm. So still a little too early to tell. Yeah. But overall, I mean, inventory is kind of light. But you are seeing opportunities within the Fraser Valley. When I look at what's happening in the Fraser Valley, there still seems to be a lot of optimism in the real estate world. The biggest challenge being uh, managing you know, the rising or dealing with rising costs and low inventory. Mm -hmm. uh, but economically, everybody still seems, I guess, quite confident. Are you getting any sense of it in the, on, when you're in, like, in the trenches in terms of that economic confidence? Absolutely. I mean, we've got, uh, we went from having a very, very slow year to the phone starting to ring um, significantly more. Buyers that had said, I have no interest in real estate are now coming back into the fold. Um, you know, sellers that have been told that it's not a good time to sell are now starting to understand that, yeah, actually it is. It, it turns out the sky is not in fact falling and the number of people that needed housing hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they maybe have, they took a step back and they reset, they reposition and they refocused but now they're ready to get back into it. And uh, I mean, that's apparent in the sales data. It, it's only increasing. Beautiful. OK, so, you know, you mentioned earlier about the market going into multiple offers. And of course, multiple offers can be very intimidating for the buyer to a lesser degree, the, the seller. But 
how do we compete in a multiple offer scenario without taking a bath and being worried about overpaying or how do we approach it strategically, Jordan? I mean, you've been doing this a long time. You're the best in the business, Eximus Real Estate. Like you guys are really uh, foundational in the Fraser Valley. Uh, so you've got lots of experience. Share a little bit of insights. How do we deal with this multiple offer world that we sometimes are finding ourselves in? Yeah. You know, it depends on the severity of that multiple offer situation, right? If um, it, when things started to pick up here last month, it's crazy how fast things have been accelerating here. Uh, about a month, month and a half ago, we started getting a, a little bit of extra pull. If it was a really well-priced A listing, showed awesome inside, had great curb appeal, there was definitely people interested in it. You know, you might have gotten two or three offers. And then at that point, it was really, you want to bring the sharpest offer possible, but generally there were still subjects on it, meaning you had an opportunity to do um, your due diligence for financing, inspection, or review of all of the documents. So at that point, you would want to make those subjects as short as possible, working with your mortgage broker to be getting a timeline, not five business days, but maybe 48 hours, right? Having that offer tailored to those sellers as well, finding out what their specific dates are, what are their expectations, having a really open line of communication with that seller and that seller's agent is definitely beneficial. You know, in those situations, you can have a much sharper offer and still have an opportunity to win. Today, depending on the properties, you know, I lost in multiples against 25 other bids on Monday, Tuesday, excuse me. We went, uh, we went $150,000 over list price wow. and it's for 250,000 over list price subject free. And this is an Abbotsford on an okay house. <laughs> At that point, there's all the strategizing that you can do and it kind of just goes out the window. And, you know, ultimately you get to the point where it's just the person that's got the biggest bag of money swinging on the hip and they're not willing to do or not worried about doing due diligence, the seller is going to take that that jackpot number in a lot of cases. So if you've got, you know, a whole army of people that you're fighting against on these properties, you know, there's only so much you can do as far as strategy. And at that point, I would say, why are we even looking at this place? You're going to spend $100,000 more than you really should on it anyway. Why don't we go and find that overpriced house that's been sitting there for three months? that everyone is ignoring because none of the agents actually want to do any work. Let's go negotiate them down to a much better number than a fighting against these 25 other people to overpay on this house. Well, you know, something, this is such a good point that you make, Jordan. And I know that this comes from your experience and understanding the psychology of sellers, for example. And it, I was just in Kelowna where that market is off the charts hot again. Uh, they do have about three and a half months of inventory, however, but the market is in fact very hot, lots of deals being done. And I just had this similar conversation. And in this case, it was with the listing agent of a property and how the seller gets stuck over on a, on a $2.2 million house is being stuck over 50, you know, over a $50,000 price difference because they got a lower offer, $50,000, $2.2 million. They're going, no, I'm not doing it. And it was only because of the realtor and the listing agent really sitting down with the seller, giving them perspective. But here's the thing about it. They finally did the deal and, and he gave in or they gave in that on that 50 grand. But it was literally having to sit with the seller and point out to them just what was going on in the market and where they're you know, if they continue to hold it there, how they risk having that price drop even more. Because if it's on the market for longer, then it becomes like, okay, it's still not selling. You're yeah. going to drop your price a hundred grand or 150 grand. So it is an interesting psychology, isn't it? But I love that strategy is that's actually probably where you want to start looking is go to those properties that must be overpriced because they've been sitting on the market for an extended period of time. Anything in this market that is what? Oh, on the market for over a month is considered getting stale. I don't know. What's the, what's kind yeah. of the benchmark these days? You know what? Anything. Yeah. 30 days is definitely going to be considered stale. If it's a, a decent looking house at this point, anything over seven days, you're asking yourself why it hasn't sold. That's how fast it's changed here. Um, but yeah, seven to 14 days over that. I'm going to say, you know, you guys are overpriced. Why don't you have people knocking on your door? And I, I had this, uh, this exact conversation with the, an agent, you know, I, I was working with uh, clients in Walnut Grove and Walnut Grove has been, because it's a, a small, really insular community. There's not a lot of homes that come up for sale there. It's been a hot market for a while. And that's actually kind of been my canary that I've been watching 
to see how that movement and activity has been continuing to pick up. And I've said, well, it's getting busier and busier out west. It typically filters east. It's done this many times over the last you know decade. It's going to happen again. And of course it did. Um, but there was a there was a townhouse in Walnut Grove. It was overpriced. It's been sitting there for 60 days. And I asked them, well, why haven't you gotten offers? You know, why is you know, your seller is very confident on the price. Why doesn't the market feel that way? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, just you start planting those seeds of doubt. It doesn't happen overnight. You're not going to go and walk up to these people and get an accepted offer on that same day. These are generally, you know, stubborn sellers that are set on their prices. So you've got to have a mindset of this is going to be a bit of a battle and I'm going to have to chip away at them over the next couple of days, week, you know, or more. It's interesting, too, is that sellers particularly and buyers, I guess, you know, in the world of real estate, we can all psychologically, emotionally get into it and, you know, take these stands and draw these lines and, you know, it's worth this much or I'm going to buy that for this much. And the reality of it is, and to your point, is the market dictates the reality of what is going on. And even the best negotiators at some point realize that this isn't about me. It's not about the buyer. It's not about the seller. It's just about the market. It is what it is. Make your call, write the offer, accept the offer, whatever it's going to be. And uh, just realizing it is, in fact, the market that calls the final shot. What's your thoughts? Absolutely. And I mean, it's listening to that. And I say to my sellers, I can't control anything. I'm not going to, you know, I, I can't magically make a buyer appear. And when I put your listing up on the marketplace, we're going to pay attention to what the market tells us. What's the mm -hmm. feedback? How many showings? How much interest? If we're getting nothing, well, then we're probably not positioned correctly, whether that's price or the, the, the view of the home. Right. Um, as realtors, as buyers and sellers, we don't none of us have magic powers and we can't we can't force people and, and mind control people to make decisions. So it's just about being light on your feet and paying attention to the to the trends and the clues that the market gives us. So, Jordan, I mean, Eximus has been part of the rain team in terms of being trusted partners for a long time. You know us well. We know you well. We see how you see the market. But give us an update on actually based on what Eximus sees. So in other words, you've got a great team. You really pay attention to what's going on in the market. You understand fundamentals and influencers and all of the things, but you're literally focused on the Fraser Valley. You're kind of, I would say, at the heartbeat of what's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, any thought processes, and we won't hold you to it, any forecasts, predictions of how long this market's going to stay in place? You have some kind of insights into that from your perspective? How are you looking at this market? Is it... Yeah. You know, you know yeah. <laughs> maybe it's some optimism on my part, but I don't think this craziness is going to last too long. Um, you know, I, it's it's strictly because we're we're very low inventory. And a lot of that has been because sellers have been hammered for the last 12 months getting told this is the worst time to sell. As they start hearing these stories about multiples and, and it getting better and better, we're going to start seeing people realize, hey, this is actually a good time to sell. I can get, you know, almost the all time high again. We're, we're approaching those numbers very quickly actually so i think we'll have a lot more inventory hit the market i do hope that we have more inventory hit the market come the summer when those buyers tend to to leave the marketplace and things will stabilize mm -hmm. i don't see this this trend of 25 offers lasting for a year year and a half the way that we saw it through 2021 and, and part way through 2022 because it's becoming more and more challenging financing wise Right. The, the government is doing a really good job of restricting the ability of folks to to purchase real estate. So, you know, it, it doesn't reduce the demand necessarily, but the the affordability hasn't increased. So if we have more options, that will definitely slow things down. And I do think that'll come. Well, it certainly is an interesting time. Uh, I mean, not just an interesting time in British Columbia, in Canada, even when we look globally, just what the heck is going on in this world? It is very, very interesting and the impact it's having on real estate, on people's attitudes around real estate. And everybody keeps calling for this big bubble to burst, yet there's no indicators that there is a bubble. Although it's like, how can it not be a bubble? Prices are up like off the charts. How can this not be a bubble? And why hasn't it popped? And I'm going to wait till it does. And, you know, at the end of the day, there's no indicators really that this is a bubble that's going to burst you know maybe there'll be some slow pullback i mean i think there's got to be some pretty big economic events to have that happen and they're certainly sitting on the sidelines perhaps we don't see them happening 
But, you know, anyways, I, I look at this market and uh, Jordan, I still am such a huge believer in real estate as being part of a financial plan from an investment point of view. I think from a home point of view, if you're buying a home, you're going to be in it for uh, years to come. Really, uh, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter if you buy right in terms of the best you can. Uh, look after yourself in terms of what you can afford from a mortgage perspective. I think you're going to do exceptionally well. So, Jordan, anything that you would like to add as we kind of roll this and close this out? Yeah, I mean, I think you touched on it, right? Uh, investing here is 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 uh, you know traditionally been a, an incredibly safe uh, choice. You know, as long as people continue to pour in, we have our immigration has is reaching you know all time high levels. We are not keeping up on the supply side. We're simply not building enough housing. We have too much red tape to be able to allow developers to quickly pivot. Um, mm -hmm. Homeowners are not easily allowed to add secondary suites in most municipalities. Some of that's changing, but we don't have enough housing for the heads that we are bringing in. So it's you know, we, we can talk about larger economic fundamentals, but it's the supply and demand of it. The demand is ever growing and the supply isn't shrinking, but it's definitely not not keeping pace. So that's going to keep the prices, if not steady, you know, increasing. Well, you know, and, and I'll end on this note, and that is my definition of housing crisis insanity. The new definition of insanity is expecting the source of our housing crisis problems, which is our government, to actually be also the solution to the housing yes. crisis that they have created and continue to create. That's insanity. We have to realize that supply is not going to get fixed anytime soon. And even if they could flip a switch and all, you know, at all three levels of a government agree on how we're going to drive this hard and we're going to remove all these barriers, all these filters, if that happened tomorrow with a magical switch, a wand that says go, uh, it'll be years before we can actually create the supply to meet the demand. So from a investment point of view, from a housing point of view, hard to imagine at this point that housing is doing anything but increasing over time. And of course, that's why we love real estate. So uh, Jordan, always, always appreciate your expertise and your perspective on what's going on in British Columbia and specifically the Fraser Valley. Folks, if you really want to get looked after, this is your man, Eximus Real Estate, Jordan Spitters. Thanks for your time, my friend. Thanks, Patrick.